Hi everyone, this is Professor Fernandez. In this video, we are going to talk about Lesson uh, 10, Module 1. So this lesson is about double and triple integrals over rectangular regions. The one quick thing that I mentioned about this lesson is that it marks the start of a new unit in the course, and this is unit number three, which is on multiple integration. So, you know, this is really a departure from what we've been doing thus far in the course. Thus far, we've been studying the geometry of three-dimensional space um, vectors, and we've also recently been studying in the second unit the differentiation of multivariable functions. And then, of course, all throughout graphing multivariable functions and, and visualizing them in three space. Um, this is the first time that we're kind of pivoting back to that other half of calculus, which is integration. And, you know, throughout these videos, we're going to talk about some of the foundational concepts, like Riemann sums that you might remember from that content. In this first lesson, though, uh, this first module, we're going to talk about just integration if, of a two or three variable function over a rectangular domain. So before I get there, I'll just mention really quickly, this is one of the um, ongoing multivariable calculus in the real world examples. Uh, this case, in this case, it's an application to population density. So check it out if you have a moment, uh, and this will reoccur in the practice problems. You'll come back to this application to think more about how uh, multiple integrals show up in the real world. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's get started on the first module, talking about double integrals over rectangular regions. You might be already thinking, this is a little crazy. <laughs> How can I integrate twice? Um, and that's basically what double integrals are. So I just want to start by reminding you what the story was, roughly speaking, from single variable calculus. And that was where we started thinking about a function, y equals f of x. Uh, there it is. And we were trying to figure out the area between the function and the x-axis, the graph of the function. And we were trying to find a way to make sense of this. And through lots of very creative methods, we eventually, we mathematicians eventually figured out that we could at least approximate this area by chopping up the interval AB into different sub-intervals. I've, I've now chopped it up here into one, two, three, three subintervals. So I'm going to keep track of that with the capital N number here. Um, and then picking a point uh, somewhere in these subintervals, maybe like right there, and then maybe right there, and maybe right there, and then looking at the y value of that point and creating a rectangle that has that height and is the width of the subinterval wide. Um, so I can do that over here for this subinterval. There we go that creates that rectangle. And then I can do it for this one over here, creating that rectangle. And then the sort of creative genius is that you can see, that's why I zoomed in. Um, these rectangles almost actually capture the full area under the curve. They miss a little bit, they might overdo it a little. So we can see in this picture that that little part there overdoes it, uh, and that little part there underdoes it. Um, but you know, if we write down mathematically what the sum of these three areas, uh, of the three areas of these black um, rectangles are, then it is the sum from one to three of the value of the function, which are the rectangle heights, times the width of each one of the subintervals. So I'm gonna call this first width here delta x1, call the second width here delta x2, and then call the third width here delta x3. And then this first y value here is f of x1 star. So I'm calling the star points, you know, if I zoom back in, these x values. This is x star 1, and this is x star 2, and this is x star 3. Okay, <clears throat> so this thing on the right hand side over here is somewhat familiar, hopefully, this is called a Riemann sum, an example of a Riemann sum. And you can see that already, this is a pretty good approximation to the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. One of the takeaways from Riemann sums is that as we decreased the width of the subintervals in the nicest cases, then this approximation would get better and better and better and would actually get closer and closer and closer to the actual area under the curve. 
And if you made these subintervals really um, regular, so if you chose them to be all the same width, delta x, and then you took the limit as delta x went to zero, that's when you actually got this definite integral. In fact, that's how we defined the definite integral in the simplest cases. So what I'm going to do is redo all of this now and just generalize it to functions of multiple variables. So how are we going to do that? Well, the picture is, as usual, a bit more involved, but I'm going to draw my usual representative surface over here. There we go. That's my S. I'm going to assume that this is the graph of z equals f of x, y, and then I'm just going to generalize what we just, what we just talked about above. First of all, let's just assume that this portion of the graph of S is generated by the uh, domain, this rectangular domain down here. So, you know, we are soon going to talk about a double integral over a rectangular domain, and we're only going to focus on rectangular domains in this lesson. In the subsequent lesson, the next one, we are going to talk about more general domains. Okay, and let's assume that, oops, I erased all that, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> let's assume that. Um, the a value, or, or the, oh, because I'm using the eraser, that's why. <laughs> Let's assume that this rectangle starts off at x equals a, and it finishes off over here at x equals b. Then it starts off at y equals c, and then it finishes off a little bit further this way, extending the axis at y equals d. So if I look now in the plane x and y, if I look down from the z, val uh, z axis onto the plane, then I have a rectangle that looks like this. And just for notation's sake, we're going to denote this as r equals the interval ab cross the interval cd. And this is somewhat new notation. This is you know a Cartesian product. It's pick a point here to be your x-coordinate, pick a point here to be your y-coordinate, and then that gives you a point in x in the xy plane. Um, OK, and now we're going to do the same thing we did before. So we are going to partition this x um, direction into some slices. And we're also going to slice the y direction in some way. So this generates for me a partition of this rectangle. There we go. And I'm going to duplicate it over here. I'm going to partition. Let's just make it a little easier. There we go. That's my partition. Like we did over here, we know it's tiny, but there it is, a little bigger. We chose representative points that we then evaluated the function at, multiplied by the width of the rectangle to create an area. Then we added those areas to approximate the area under the curve. So that's how the story went in single variable calculus. We do the exact same thing here. So here are the steps. The first thing I do is I create um, my, I take my point uh, in one of these rectangles. I choose basically a point in one of these rectangles. It could be anywhere. These little sub rectangles that I've now created from my partition. Um, and then to be a bit more concrete, let's take, for example, this one. And this is a point now xi star yj star. So I've, I've now partitioned ab into, again, n sub intervals. So in this case, 1, 2, 3, n is 3. And I've partitioned CD, let's say, into capital M subintervals. In this case, 1, 2. So, you know, this index here ranges from 1 to 3 in this case. And this index here ranges from 1 to 2. When you multiply M and N, in this case, you get 1, 2, 3. That's 3 times 2. That's 6. Those are the number of subrectangles that you have created from your partition. So anyway, going back to this little lonely point, uh, we pick that point, um, and then what do we do with it? We put it into the function to look at its output value. So you know, if I go back to my 3D view here, there's my point. I'm going up to the function. There is its value. And now, just like we did before up here, where we generated the rectangles that correspond to all of these points, uh, widths, and lengths. Here I'm going to generate the um, rectanguloid. So I'm going to then go up here to the function, and then go over here, and go over here, and then draw the rectangle that has that f of x star y star value as its height. 
and has this as the area of its base. So that then gives me um, a, I'm running out of space here, that then gives me a volume. So the height of the rectangle, there it is, times the small area, I'm going to call it delta A sub IJ. In other words, that is the area of this um, base. So base times height gives you the volume of this rectanguloid. And then what do I do? Like what I did before, now I just do it for all of these other points over here in the bottom left. So I add all of these volumes, and I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. I add all of these volumes across all of my partitions for the x, a to B interval, and all of my partitions for the Y, C to D interval. And now this thing should look like a Riemann sum. If we scroll up, it looks very similar to that, except that there are two sums. That's okay, because now I'm working in two dimensions for my partitions. Um, and so indeed, this is a Riemann sum. It is a two variable Riemann sum. And I should expect that if I you know, move things up here, create a little bit more space for myself, I should expect that as n and m go to infinity, as I squeeze in more partitions in here and more partitions in there, and my um, rectanguloids get finer and finer and kind of tinier and more infinitesimal, I should expect that I would get a double integral of the function where everything becomes infinitesimal. These finite changes in the area, finite uh, base area of each of these little rectanguloids would become an infinitesimal area. Um, and then I'm, I'm not going to worry about putting the limits here for now because we're going to do that a little bit later. I'll just put a sub r here. Um, again, remembering that r was the region we started with. Um, and that is basically a double integral in a nutshell. So it's very similar to what you learned about in single variable calculus, just now done in two dimensions. Um, I'm just going to run through this definition real quick so that we have all of the terminology down. Um, to be uh, completely honest, we will do an example in a minute about uh, using that uses this idea of a double Riemann sum. But as you might remember from single variable calculus, right after you learned about Riemann sums, you might have done an example or two, and then you were off to the fundamental theorem of calculus and integration techniques and other ways to actually calculate integrals, not approximate them. So again, the story is going to repeat itself here. So this definition says, let's, um, uh, let R be a rectangular region in the xy plane, just like this one up here, um, and denote P a partition of R into n by m grid of subrectangles. So keep this in mind. And let norm of P denote the maximum of the lengths and widths of all the rectangle, subrectangles in P. First thing to mention, um, in math we run out of letters. So uh, we think of norm, in this class we've thought of it as the norm of a vector. You can also define something like the norm of a partition. We are doing it here. We're saying let this symbol denote. So we're defining what the symbol means. What does it mean? The maximum of the lengths and widths of all the subrectangles in the partition P. So if this doesn't make too much sense, that's okay. Because what we're trying to say is, you know, we could have chosen a partition. Maybe this is your rectangle. And this is how you decide to partition it. Right? Some of these rectangles are really long. Some of these rectangles are really wide. So all we're saying is that we're going to define the norm of the partition to be the maximum of the lengths and widths of all the subrectangles. You'll see why in a minute. Um, and then next, like we, like I did above um, in the uh, intro, we are going to define, denote by delta sub a sub ij the area of the ij rectangle in P, and by the starred points, the particular point in that subrectangle that um, we will in a minute put into the function f. Finally, we define the double integral of a function f over r as the equal equality of the limit as the partition norm goes to zero of this double Riemann sum. So this explains a lot. First of all, it explains why I did all this stuff here above. 
Second of all, it explains, as I promised, you know, what the norm of the partition does. We are taking the limit as the norm of the partition goes to zero. What is the norm of the partition? The maximum of the lengths and widths of all the rectangles. Translation, we are making the largest sub-rectangle, the largest sub-rectangle, uh, go to zero in width and or length, whatever, whichever one is bigger. So again, we are trying to take our partition here and cram in as many sub-rectangles as we want, as we can, without imposing any order, right? I'm not going to force you, for example, to make all the lengths and widths of these sub-rectangles the same. Nope, you can choose them to be different lengths and widths, so long as the maximum, the maximum of the lengths and widths of all of your sub-rectangles in the limit as I go to zero um, produces a number. So here's the provided the limit exists. We call that number the double integral of f over the region r. And then we say f is integrable over r. Okay, so this is all again the theory behind double integrals. Uh, it mimics the theory behind single integrals back from calculus one. So we're about to do an example and I'll show you as I promised to this in a graph. Um, but some couple of quick notes. Analogous to single definite integrals, double integrals over a region measure the net sine volume. Right? I mean, fundamentally what we're doing is we're, we're, we're multiplying values of the function with a bunch of areas. Um, the areas can't be negative. We, we, we can't measure a negative area, but we can certainly have negative outputs for the function. So this product could be negative, and then you're adding it a bunch of times to other things. So you could end up with a negative number. What would that mean? Just like in single variable calculus, it would tell you that there's, well, in single variable calculus, a negative number output for a definite integral told you that there's more area under the x-axis than there is above the x-axis. Similar thing here. You know, if we go back to my picture, we would not expect to get a negative double integral for this because all of the volume is above the xy plane. But we could certainly draw lots of pictures where most of the volume is below the xy plane. You know, I could just take this picture and make the xy plane be up here so that the graph of f is, of s is uh, the graph, the surface s is below the xy plane. We could do that. And then we get a negative, quote, negative volume. I prefer not to think of it that way. I prefer to think of it as a net signed volume that is negative you know, acknowledging the fact that negative volumes just don't exist. Okay, so second note, um, as in single variable calculus, uh, this thing that we talked about here is a double Riemann sum, and we can use it to approximate the double integral. So let me show you finally how to do that through an example, and then visualize for you how all this works. So here's our first example. Um, estimate the volume of the solid that lies above the square r here, and below the elliptic paraboloid given by this. Um, divide r into four equal squares and choose the sample point to be the upper right corner of each square. Sketch the solid and then approximate um, the rectangular uh, and the approximating rectangular boxes. Okay, so there is no shortage of work to do. <laughs> um, but this is, you know, why I wanted to pick this example to illustrate all the stuff we just talked about. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch the region. So I'm told that, and by the way, when you're given a region like this, the convention is to assume that this tells you the x extent of the region, this tells you the y extent. So um, I am going from 0 to 2 in x, and I'm going from 0 to 2 in y. So this is my region r. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I am also told that I am going to divide r into four equal squares. Okay, so if I do that, you know, I'm basically being told that I'm going to chop it up this way. Great. Uh, and I'm going to choose sample points to be the upper right corner of each square. So I'm going to keep using black here for the sample points, upper right corner of each square. So these are the sample points that I'm going to choose. I don't have to do a lot of math to figure out where these sample points are. This one is on the upper vertex of the square, 2 comma 2. This one is just one of those down, so 2 comma 1. And then this one is uh, x equals 1, y equals 2. And then this one over here is x equals 1, y equals 1. Great. And then, so I, I have, I've divided the r into four equal squares. I've chosen those sample points. Um, and now I'm going to actually uh, approximate the volume 
uh, we're going to estimate the volume um, that lies above the square and below the elliptic parabola. Okay, so let me graph the region now, rough sketch, and then I'll show you what this looks like in a minute. So this is an elliptic paraboloid that we're dealing with up here. So if I think about how to graph this, again, we have several options. One of them is looking at the level curves. So if I look at the level curves, then I get 16 minus k equals x squared plus 2y squared by rearranging things. This is why it's called an elliptic paraboloid, because this, this produces elliptical curves. If it was x squared plus y squared equals a number, it'd be a circle. But the uh, 2 here makes it into not quite a circle, it makes it into an ellipse. Um, so I could go through and talk about major and minor axes, but I, I don't want to do that. Um, I just want to point out that when I plot this, you know, at x equals um, 0 and y equals 0, I get 16. So that's kind of the highest extent of this paraboloid. Um, and then at z equals 0, I get um, this equals uh, 16. And again, that's an ellipse, and it's got a um, larger extent in x than it does in y. So the x extent is uh, 4, and then the y extent would be um, square root of 8, which is uh, 2 root 2, I believe. So um, not quite 4, so a little bit less than that. Okay, um, great. So then I have some sense of what my, uh, ex the extent of my ellipse looks like. I'll just draw it in the first quadrant, elliptic paraboloid, so it opens downward. So I have a picture that looks something like that. Imagine kind of a little cap. Um, and again, the region that we're considering from two, uh, 0 to 2 in x, 0 to 2 in y, is therefore sitting like somewhere in here. So here's 2, and then you know, 2 might be over here. Uh, and it might, might touch just the base of the, or the, uh, the, the uh, extent of the ellipse here that um, is in the xy plane. Um, and then so what we want to do is we want to estimate the volume of the solid between the xy plane in this region and the graph of the function. So at this point, I'm going to switch over. So now you can actually see I've kind of reached my drawing capabilities here, uh, my limits. And I'm going to switch over so you can see what this looks like. Okay, so we see here the elliptic paraboloid as drawn, uh, my attempt at least. Um, and we see that the, the function itself, um, the, the, this program is not actually graphing all of it. You can see these jagged edges down here. That's okay. That's some numerical um, artifacts there. Um, and, uh, oops, I actually noticed that I'm not plotting the exact ellipse that we're talking about. So let me go in here and do that. Uh, so it was a 16, not a 6. So let's just move that into a 16. There we go. And then we're going to have to change our maximum here. So Z max is 16. And then this is 16. And there we go. Um, great. So that is our elliptic parabola. Um, so it is you know, much uh, higher than uh, the rest of the x and y bounds, but that's OK. Um, so this is the solid, the surface that we're going to try to find the volume of. And we're going to try to find the volume of the surface on the region 0 to 2. So how do I show you what that region looks like? Well, I'm going to put the region in here. So uh, oops. So let me scroll down here and put in the same information here so we can see this region. So uh, 0 to 2 in x and then 0 to 2 in y. Great. And so what have I done? So I've clicked a bunch of buttons and things have appeared. So first of all, I'm looking at it from below here. You see there the, the square region, x going from 0 to 2 and y going from 0 to 2. And I've now subdivided um, x and y into two equal subintervals. I did that by playing around with this here, actually. So I'll show you if I change this, I get more subdivision c and x, but I keep the ones in y the same. Um, and then what am I going to do? So I'm going to zoom out here and just show you, this is kind of at the beginning of the video what I was um, doing uh, in the notes. If I turn off the surface, there we go. These are the 
uh, rectanguloids that are generated by picking points in that domain, in that rectangular domain on the xy plane, um, and then evaluating the function at those points. Um, so what points did I choose here? Uh, that, is, that can be controlled over here by determining what uh, points you select here. So I'm going to choose upper right. That's what we were told in our example. Um, and then I'm going to turn back the surface, uh, turn on the surface once again. Uh, and you can see there that I'm choosing the upper right points. And it's a little hard to see, but uh, you can see, move this. You can see that this uh, point just touches the function. That is the evaluation point as far as finding the volume of this rectanguloid is concerned. All right, so now you have some picture of what's going on. Um, let me scroll up and show you or, or at least uh, predict for us what's going to happen. Um, so I'm going to uh, just, if you click on any one of these things, you'll notice down here that some information has popped up about what the applet is telling you it thinks. Oh, it disappeared. What the applet is telling you it thinks the volume of the region is based on the approximation that you chose. So uh, we've told it that we want to choose two subdivisions for x and y. We've told it that we want the subdivisions to go from 0 to 2 in x, 0 to 2 in y. So we've, and, and we want it to go all the way up to the function itself. Based on all of that, the system is then telling us that the um, calculation for the volume using this Riemannsa method, it is telling us is 34 units cubed. So again, that's adding up these four, the volumes of these four rectangulars. Great, so I'm gonna switch over back now and I'm gonna show you how we will get that number without the help of this technology, how we do this by hand, so to speak. Again, illustrating all this stuff. All right, so the first thing we do is we say, great, the volume is approximately the Riemann sums. Remember, this is f of the points that we chose times the little areas that are the base of these rectangulates as we go from one to however many subdivision, subdivisions in x there are. In this case, there's one, there's two, one to two, and however many subdivisions there are in y, one to two also. Great, so here m and n the number of subdivisions, uh, the size of the grid, if you will. Um, M and N are the same, they're both two. And then I'm gonna just write this out. So what is this sum equal to? So uh, I can just go around, you know, basically what I do is I pick a point, I plug it into F, and then I multiply by the area of the rectangle that point is in. So I'm gonna choose that point. So this is F of one, one times delta A, the area of this rectangle. We know what it is, but I'm not going to put it in there to make a, a point haha, later on. Um, and then I go back and I pick another one. Let's pick this one. F of 1, 2 times the area that it, uh, of the rectangle that it touches. Um, and then why not let's go over here. Plus F of 2, 1 times delta A. And then plus F of 2, 2 delta A. Okay. You notice that because we chose equal subdivisions, um, all the sub rectangles are the same size, the same area, therefore. Then I can, that has shown up in my Riemann sum in the form of a quantity which I can factor out, which is delta A. So that's what I'm going to do. And that's why I wanted to, I didn't want to calculate it, even though we see that delta A in this case is 1. Because, um, it's an opportunity for me to say, had we chosen, you know, um, more subdivisions, maybe subdivided it into four equal parts, not two, um, we could still do this same math and then at the end of the day calculate what del delta A is, and the same thing would happen. What would happen? We would end up just adding these y values, or these z values in this case, and then multiplying by delta A. So there's a nice little symmetry and nice simplifications here that appear when you make the partitions so-called regular. You choose them, the subrectangles, to be the same size. Um, so at this point, what we do is we evaluate the function. So we know what f of x, y is. It's the 16 minus x squared minus 2y squared. I'm just going to give you the numbers that we get from that evaluation. 
so that we don't spend time substituting those in and then calculating all the squares and subtractions and all that. And then I'll just give you, or we'll note at this point, this is 20 uh, plus uh, 14 is the 34, um, you know, units cubed, right? It is a volume. And remember when we went back here and we had the applet telling us its estimate of what the volume is, um, there it is down here, 34 units cubed. So that's where that number comes from. Um, and that is this concept in a nutshell. So the, you know, I, I left space here because uh, I was wondering, you know, thinking about how much to draw, but ultimately decided that it's easier for you to see the technology than it is for me to try to draw anything beyond this point. Um, so what I want to do next is move on to, again, as I said, in single variable calculus, what happens after Riemann sums. Now we have a notion of how we would approximate a double integral over a rectangular region. And we've done an example to show that and we visualize what all that means. Um, what if I want to, you know, just calculate the double integral? I don't want to approximate it, I want to calculate it. Well, this is where the notion of an iterated integral comes in. So suppose f is a function continuous on the rectangle a, b to c, d. So these are going to be standard assumptions for this lesson, uh, for this module. Um, the integrals blah are, all, are called iterated integrals. Okay, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at the function times dy dx and then integrated from c to d and then a to b. Okay. So this is, this is the first time we're seeing this, so let me, let me run through this in a bit more detail. Um, this is the integrand like we've always known it. This is again thinking of, of this as the dA, the small area element that we were using for the Riemann sums. But now we're thinking of it slightly split up. So we're saying, hey, let's integrate this function with respect to y as y goes from c to d. Well, it's a two variable function. If you integrate out the y, you're going to be left with a bunch of x's. Then let's go back and integrate with respect to x, what we're left with, as x goes from a to b. That's called an iterated integral over a rectangle. In this case, this specific rectangle. You could also go back and do things the other way. You could say, okay, same function, but now let's integrate with respect to x as x goes from a to b. This is a two variable function. You will integrate out all the x's. You'll be left with a bunch of y's. And then let's go back, integrate with respect to y as y goes from c to d. And then you might wonder, do I get the same thing? Does it matter if I integrate first with respect to x and then with respect to y or vice versa? Um, and we will see that this notion will recur over and over again. And there are theorems that tell us that in the nicest cases, we do get the same thing. These, these theorems are called Fubini's theorems. They're due to mathematician Fubini. And the theorems say the following. Suppose f is a function that's continuous on the rectangle, again, standard assumption. Then the double integral over the rectangle r of the function f is any one of these two iterated integrals. They both give you the same result. In other words, if I'm going to integrate a continuous double, uh, a, a two variable function over a rectangle, rectangular domain, in other words, if I want to calculate this, then I have choices, right? I can first integrate with respect to y and then with respect to x, or first with respect to x and then with respect to y the results will be the same, according to Fubini's theorem. So I want to illustrate this for you uh, and then show you again, as I've been alluding in, as you did in single variable calculus, how this allows us to move away from Riemann sums and not having to approximate, but being able to actually evaluate the iterated integrals. So that's what we're gonna do here. So let's take this first one, um, A. So here's our integrand x, y squared. And we are going to integrate this first with respect to y from y equals 1 to 2, and then with respect to x from x equals 0 to 1. Great. So how do we do this? Well, let's write it down a little bit larger here. x, y squared, dy, dx. And here's what you do, right? It's going to take some time to get used to this. This is a new concept. But uh, with practice, as with all new things, you will get better. Um, I'm going to look at this integrand, and I'm going to think back to my partial derivatives. Remember when we calculated partial derivatives, we kind of pretended the other variable was constant. I'm going to do exactly the same thing here, but in terms of integration. 
So when I integrate with respect to y, I'm going to pretend that x is constant. So this might as well be like a 2. We might as well be integrating 2y squared. So the antiderivative of xy squared, considering only y as the variable, is xy cubed over 3. Because when I integrate y squared with respect to y, I get y cubed over 3 plus c. Um, so the same fundamental theorem of calculus that you know and love from single variable calculus transfers over into the setting. So we're going to evaluate this xy cubed over 3 integral from 1 to 2. And this is, again, the part that might get some, take some getting used to. We still have another integral to do with respect to x, and we'll do that in a minute after we figure out what this first evaluation is. So I'm going to do the same thing I've done you know, before. I'm going to insert 2 here for y, and that is going to give me um, x times 2 cubed over 3. And then I'm going to insert um, 1 here for y and subtract. That is going to give me 1 cubed over 3 dx. So again, I'm treating x as if it were a constant. Might as well be 14, you know, for all, our, uh, for all we care. Um, and over here, then I just simplify. I get 8x over 3 minus 1 third x dx equals, or let's do it over here, equals, and then I can just simplify here. This is 7 thirds x dx. So I will pause here to, to observe that we started with a double integral and we've now reduced it to a single integral. This should make sense in a way. You know, we started by with, with the objective of integrating twice. We integrated once, so now we have one more integral left to do. Uh, so it seems, you know, kind of logical phrased that way. But the other reason I wanted to pause here is to mention that, at least for now, these double integrals really are going to reduce to single integrals at some point. So again, you're going to be able to use everything that you know uh, and have learned from Calculus 1 to finish double integral type calculations, at least in these simple uh, cases. And then over here, you know, the 7 thirds, we could pull that out. That's one of the properties of single variable integrals, which I've, I'm, I'm planting the seed to uh, make you question, do these properties transfer over? into the double integral context, and stay tuned, that's in module 3. Um, and then here I just integrate x, and I get x squared over 2, evaluate it from 0 to 1, and that gives me um, just 1 half. So I get 7 over 6, and that is my uh, answer. What does this represent? Well, if I look at this function, this is x, y squared, um, and I think of the function z equals x, y squared, First of all, uh, over the interval, over the rectangle that's being um, uh, plotted, uh, d the domain that we're using for the integration here, this is the rectangle from 0 to 1 in x, and then 1 to 2 in y. If I visualize all this, right, I actually don't have an offhand um, simple surface to draw for you of what this looks like, but um, the point I want to make is that the rectangle goes from 0 to 1, over here, and it goes from um, 1 to 2 over here. So we have uh, this rectangle. This is our region of integration. And this function on this region is non-negative, right? There are no negative values. So x is always between 0 and 1. y squared is always between 1 and 4. Um, so whatever the graph of this you know, looks like, and we could do some work to do it, but I'm just going to draw some you know, random surface. The point is that there are no negative values. So in this case, we can interpret 7, 6. You know, it is always the net signed volume, but we don't need the net or the signed in this case. Um, in this case, it really is the volume uh, under, so to speak, the graph of this function and uh, over this particular domain. So I would put 7, 6 here units cubed. Okay, so that's a nice interpretation of what that number means. Um, let me contrast this a little bit with part B here of this example. So let's look at this one. This is integral from 0 to 2, integral from 1 to 2 of x minus 3y squared 
dy dx. Okay, um, and actually, before doing that, I'll mention one quick thing. Um, I did this integral as written. In other words, I integrated first with respect to y, then with respect to x. I encourage you to swap the orders and do out the same similar calculations. You will get the same number, 7, 6. I'll just write out for you what that order swap would be. Um, we'll write it over here in blue. So I would swap, I would keep the integrand, there it is, and I would swap the order of integration here. So it'd be dx dy. Um, now the dx goes along with the limits 0 to 1. So those limits get swapped to be the first thing that you integrate with respect to. And then the, the, the uh, dy over here, those go with the limits 1 to 2. And so that ends up being the last thing you integrate with respect to. So this is the swapped iterated integral. And because this function is continuous on this rectangle, from Fubini's theorem from a few minutes ago, we expect that the value of this integral will also be 7, 6. In other words, you'll be able to get the same value regardless of which order of integration you choose. Okay, so let's go back to part B here. Um, I'm going to keep it as is. I'm going to integrate first with respect to y, um, treating again every single x in this integrand as if it were a constant. So if I were integrating 2 with respect to y, I would get 2y. Right? Again, I'm thinking of x as a constant. And then 3y uh, three three squared integrated with respect to y. That one is a little easier. That's y cubed. Don't have to pretend that the x's are constant. There are no x's. And then evaluated from 1 to 2 dx. Okay, and then I do my evaluation step here. If I put in a 2 here for y, I'm integrating with respect to y, I get 2x minus 8. And then subtract, put in a 1 here for y, I get x minus 1. Great, dx. And I do a little simplification, I get 2x minus x gives me x, and then negative 8 plus 1 gives me minus 7 dx. And then at this point, once again, we are back to single variable calculus. Many ways to do this integral. I am just going to, again, continue teasing this notion that perhaps the properties of integrals from single variable calculus carry over to this multivariable context, and they do. And I'm going to use these properties. So this is, I've split up the integral of x minus 7 into the difference of the integrals of x and the integral of 1. And then I'm just using fundamental theorem of calculus here over and over again. So if I substitute in here in my x value, I get 2 squared, which is 4, divided by 2, that's 2, minus 2 times 7, that's 14. So I get negative 12. This now is uh, still a volume. Um, although, again, I would say it's a net signed volume in this case. Why? Because we have a negative number for sure. Um, and also because this function can also attain negative values on the domain that we're talking about. Right? Uh, look at if x is 0, then we have minus 3y squared. That function is never positive. You know, it's either 0 or negative. So there are lots of places in the domain that we're integrating over where this function has negative values. So the fact that we got a negative 12 should not be interpreted as, you know, the volume under this graph is negative 12. I, I wouldn't go that route because that implies that we can, you know, conceive of a negative volume. And in the real world, I have no idea how to measure a negative volume. So I would just say there is more volume under the xy plane, you know, and in this region of integration than there is volume above the xy plane and in this region of integration. And it's sort of a, it's a completely mathematically equivalent way to say it, but it's also a bit more physically sound. Um, okay, great. So in the next module, we're going to talk about triple integrals over rectanguloid regions. So stay tuned for that. But to recap really quickly, because it is a, a new topic, so I want to make sure it sinks in. Um, this is the definition for the double integral over rectangular domains. Uh, the definition itself and all of its intricacies and the partitions of the um, the norm of the partition and, and all of that, I, I wouldn't worry so much about that, just like you probably didn't worry so much about it in single variable calculus. I would be comfortable with the terminology, the um, concepts, 
the points, you know, why we're doing this um, and how it gets us to double integrals. And I would also make sure that you can do something like example 10.1. In other words, it is useful to be able to approximate these double integrals with this double Riemann sum. Um, and that, you know, is, is a skill. That's something to learn how to do and do well. Um, that being said, most of what we will, we will be doing from here on out is actually evaluating double integrals uh, in this iterated fashion, at least in this lesson. So you do want to, at some point, um, go back and review some of your integration techniques from single variable calculus. Um, certainly in the examples that I chose here, I, I stuck with very simple functions, you know, and the single variable integrals that we eventually were reduced to were reasonably simple single variable integrals. You know, none of them required integration by parts or partial fractions, trigonometric substitution. You know, that's next level. Um, that's not to imply that, you know, you'll always run into that, but it is, again, to make the point that once you do a doubled integral and it reduces to a single integral, then you're back in calculus one land. And technically, you know, everything's fair game that you might have seen then. Last point to mention, Fubini's theorem. As I said earlier, this is something that will recur throughout this lesson and also throughout the rest of the unit. The notion that maybe I can switch the order of integration and still get exactly the same value for the double integral. We'll see that pop up over and over again. Great, so that's it for this module, and I'll see you in the next video.